So handing over to you, Margo. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, George Belinga, uh, originally from Cameroon. I'm the coordinator of COPS S34, that is uh, an African-style co-working space based here in Bilbao, in Spain. Um, we are basically working with uh, with migrants from all around the globe. We started as, as just an African or African descent uh, co-working space. Now it's open to everybody. Basically, we are trying to help migrants um, with the challenges that come from being in Europe. Those being the lack of papers, lack of work, and uh, difficulty to integrate. The difficulties are are big, are are really important, and uh, they don't have many spaces where they can actually start uh, with the right fit and uh, start their own activities. Basically, what we do in our community space is helping people that have this entrepreneurial sense, um, so they can start um, integrating in society with the different skills that they might have. We tend to uh, look for um, skill sets or talent that normally they are hidden on the other, they don't know practices. And uh, in our co-working space, what we're trying to build is an, a place where it helps uh, to understand which are the challenges, uh, how can you start uh, a new project and uh, that's where we have uh, been working during these five years. Now we are more or less 25 um, entrepreneurs in our, in our co-working space that, and the activities that vary a lot from dancing and music to import, export or to sports. So that's, um, that's the variety of projects that we got. We have faced many challenges last being this one of um, the pandemic and the confinement it has been hard nevertheless um, the resilience that we have uh, built within our community help us and help others to actually uh, overcome all these challenges and during the pandemic we we started two new projects sewing masks our uh, home delivery those are two of the of the prayers that they have maintained during 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 this time um and we are really proud of the progress that we have made so far we hopefully we can continue in this in this way and integrating more more people and uh, being more successful thank you very much Okay, thanks a lot, Margot. Maybe we'll just go straight into the questions to dealing with uh, to do with George, and then we'll come back to another video after. We'll change we'll change the order if that's okay. So okay. basically, um, George is presenting us with the issues of place and identity, the community of migrants arriving into the European cities. So through this creation of a physical space or a hub for migrants and for many, uh, George, as I understand, COP SF34 is a home. And you are addressing and bridging the gap between many of the challenges that you're facing as migrants, um, looking for a successful social inclusion through using entrepreneurship. I see you're also advocating for the huge benefits that this kind of employment creation is contributing towards the GDP growth of, of the host country like, uh, like Spain and in the Basque country. And um, also that you're constantly or uh, increasingly playing a pivotal role in working with the city you know, to address those negative stereotypes surrounding not only migrants, but also the, uh, the, the neighborhoods that they inhabit. Could you please, Talk to us a little bit about the coping mechanisms that you're using as a community in, in this post-pandemic context. You know, given that uh, your community already has so many challenges that they face from the outset. Talk to us about that, please, a little bit today. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Uh, nice introduction that you just made, Marcel, probably better than what I could uh, say about our <laughs> own. Anyway, I'll try to explain a little bit what we have tried to do during this pandemic to cope with all these changes. Um, 
First of all, I would like to say that uh, the majority of the community, uh, the migrant community over here is really resilient. They are used to live with uh, difficulties. So in the end, uh, it's kind of a tendency that they have to um, come out with ideas and come out with, with things that uh, they are innovative. That's uh, within the, the nature. So what we try also to do during this pandemic is to focus that uh, on a few things that they were needed. Uh, as you said before, uh, one of the biggest needs in, uh, in, uh, in Spain, in Bilbao in general, is to change the view from migrants. And uh, when, when we do things, we try to post, to show media what we're doing to, in order to change perception. That's what we did with the uh, uh, food uh, food delivery. We make we were delivering food to homes of those who could not or were not willing to get out of their houses, like elderly people. When you put migrants with uh, helping elderly people, that's something that will uh, capture attention over here and uh, will also help to change the image of uh, migrants. But uh, well, we were doing other things like uh, sewing masks or like. Uh, collection, uh, collecting food for those who had uh, actually less. Um, well, basically those are the things that during the pandemic we were doing, and we were trying to continue the activities in our physical space, which was no really easy, but at, at least they get a, a sense of having a place where we can join and, and be together. Okay, thanks George for that introduction. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, second on our panel today, uh, we're going to introduce Fatou Jane. Um, Margot, if you could introduce us uh, through Fatou's video, please. Good afternoon or good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Fatou Jay. I'm an architect by training, but these days I actually am a consultant working on anything having to do with making SDG 11 is a reality. So that could be policy, that could be value chains, that could be housing finance, um, whatever it takes to make sure that we have the next generation of green, inclusive and resilient cities here on the African continent. And so I wanted to share with you um, a little bit uh, of what it is that I do. And in thinking about how best to discuss it, I realized that there are two main questions uh, that my work has really been trying to answer. The first one is, how do we take advantage of, how do we take advantage of the momentum and the pressures and the challenges and also the opportunities uh, of urbanization. How do we use that momentum, that momentum for creating jobs, for building buildings, uh, new schools, new health centers, better social networks? How do we take that energy and that need and that demand and actually translate that into opportunity and strength um, at both the community level and when it comes to our built environment? The second question that I have um, and that my work has I've been very fortunate that my work has been able to focus on is how to make financial inclusion translate into economic resilience. And again, that economic resilience has to be both for the community, but then also for the buildings and the investments that are being made by the private sector as well as the public sector. Okay, thanks a lot, Margot. I'm gonna hand over to you, Lanre, my co-moderator in the, the communities. Fantastic. Thanks for, thanks for that, Marcel, and thanks, Fatou, for a great video. Um, Fatou, uh, Fatu, uh, you're doing some great work addressing the challenges of, um, of, of urbanization on the African continent and looking particularly at, obviously, vulnerable communities, the challenges and opportunities, and in particular, um, also addressing uh, some of the situations around women working in the informal sector. Um, obviously, your organization as well, in terms of your work, is obviously uniquely looking to, I guess, turn some of these challenges within construction and within affordable housing uh, into opportunities and also looking at uh, financial inclusion as well and, and being able to kind of spin that into economic resilience. So given, I guess, the, uh, the additional challenges that we've had uh, over the last uh, year and a half, 20 months or so of operating during COVID, um, how have you managed to, to maintain the momentum of turning already you know, challenging circumstances and situations for vulnerable communities potentially into opportunities um, especially given the additional, um, I guess, um, added burden on households as well. Uh, thank you, and, and thanks again for the opportunity to participate um, and discuss these pertinent issues. 
So one of the things here in Rwanda, most of you that, you know, you know Rwanda, it's very small and it's very landlocked. Um, so when you have a pandemic that closes borders, you automatically have to go into emergency mode and figure out how to become entirely self-reliant. Um, so during this period of lockdown, it became really apparent that um, everything that was happening in terms of urbanization, which is accompanied by industrialization, of course, um, that those things all of a sudden had to um, not rely on everything from the exterior, but really be locally sourced. And that was a discussion that we've been trying to have for a long time to tell people, no, let's look at local value chains and invest there. But getting a shipping container from abroad just always seems really easy. Um, but this time it forced people to have to say, okay, what do we actually have here in terms of resources? And how can we um, uh, mobilize those resources and take advantage of them? And specifically when it comes to construction, it was building local material value chains and reinforcing them. And so we were able to introduce new technologies, technologies that actually produce better materials, created more jobs, which means more opportunity. And um, what was quite interesting is that for some of these, uh, we were working specifically in the, in the brick sector, we were able to create a whole host of other jobs that were specifically for women and that women for um, which women were the best uh, candidates. And so that all of a sudden made this, this crisis moment and, and, and these difficult conditions an opportunity for, for women to be able to enter the workforce and have jobs that were specifically for them. And so that, that was one of the, the, the benefits then is, was looking at this industrialization, seeing how to open it up and make it more inclusive uh, because the need was, was so high, it is so high that we had to rely on what we have here. Fantastic, thank you so much, excellent. Um, Marcel, sure. should, we, should we move on to uh, the next video? Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Fatou. And so um, next on our panel is Odil Katesi Gakire. She is the director from Women's Cultural Center, a women's drumming group in Rwanda. In 2004, I created the first ever female drumming group in Rwanda. And this group is called Ingomansha. In the last 17 years, that culture is really a big barrier. Uh, beyond drumming, culture and arts uh, will um, rehabilitate women as human beings because the culture that exists now is supportive of men, is made by men, it gives rooms to men. And when we try to invade that space, it's very challenging to find a place in a system that didn't plan any space for you. Then do we make our own space? Do we create our own culture or do we insist of finding a place, pushing the boundaries, fighting with all the challenges to make a place? This is why I, I, I now call the women drummers, the first ever female drummers, I call them culture makers. I want them to make another culture that fits them, that translates what they need, that express them, that represents them where they feel free. Ingomasha is, is a family with uh, all the challenges that a family can have. We are a family of fighters and um, we are a family of culture, culture makers. We are making a culture that helps us and that will be really friendly to the, to, the, to the next generation, to our daughters. And now we are transmitting this, our crafts and our faith, our buttons, our arts to the next generation. Now we are a community of teachers and I like that, but we are crafting really the drum heritage. We are, we are creating now a contemporary drum. I like that also because we have spent the last 15 years learning, mastering our traditions and when we started creating our own music, it's a contemporary music, and this is also our, our signature in that. Then we are a family also of artists. Even though we will be celebrating our 20th anniversary in three years, our work is so new compared to the centuries of, of drumming practice. 
of or, or anything else. We are happy that we are almost 20, but we are so young and so fragile. Then anything that comes to, to shake, any disturbance, any, I always panic and fear because I know that it can just break down because we have not sustained the work because we need centuries, we need time so that it becomes part of the tradition, it takes roots in the larger community. So most of the time I fear all of this. I fear any disturbance, any, any even logistic barrier, any problem, uh, because uh, anything that can stop us from drumming, because it's uh, such just a new art, a new craft that we are starting just to master, and anything that can stop us, the COVID included, the COVID-19 included, I'm just panicking, and of course I panicked. But because of the lockdown, we took the drums home. And this was a good thing because we took it in the community. They were drumming from home. The neighbors were curious. Some were complaining about the noise. But it's, I think that it was a good thing because they discovered the job of the work these women were doing. They enjoyed it. They were coming to see the rehearsal. And it's as if we brought some joy in these dark periods because people were enjoying the music or not because there, there, is, also, there is always someone to complain. <laughs> yes, and they took the drums home. And this is when we started even creating. I say, OK, because we can't work together. And it was a good thing also because we started existing as individuals and to express yourself. And every day they had to send a one minute video. We bought them uh, telephones, they could film themselves and send to the, to the group on WhatsApp to, so that we keep connected. And to transform this um, challenging time in a productive time, we managed to do that because what I need most of the time is time. <clears throat> so thank you so much, Odil, for that introduction. So Odil, just to continue from your video, yours is very much a story about resilience, really from the outset, it seems to me. You're talking about a community of women drummers and that it goes beyond the boundaries of drumming as an art, really, and because you talk about touching on spaces in society where the group uh, in Goma and Shaya are the very, very first and you're paving a way for a new understanding of your art within a very traditional understanding of culture and arts, it seems to me. Please, can you talk to us about the importance of creating not just a group of individual players, but a family, and why the challenge of not having your own space is currently one of your, your biggest challenges? Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, thank you. Um, at the beginning, when we started, we were also very open to the unknown. We didn't know what will happen, if we will succeed even to play the drum, because we, are not, we were not, um, we were told that we are not strong and everything. We, we didn't plan to become a community and family. We were trying something and very open to anything that will come from, from there. But now we are 17 years after, Becoming a family was also another asset to help us sustain in the time because we were a very small family. We were, I mean, few women drumming in the country if we don't come together and we live also in uh, Huye uh, district, it was important for me that we live uh, close to each other to get a chance to sustain uh, because if we, everyone had to come from different spaces, it implies, it implied costs we could not uh, afford at that time where we were starting from scratch with no fund, with, uh, with nothing almost. And uh, it's uh, when you start some, something from, from, from zero, you, <laughs> you, you are lonely. 
you 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 understand you 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 are lonely people do not understand your vision people do not necessarily support your vision so it also helps to get to have a uh, close ties and when we look back now uh, we have we have uh, we have achieved many things we are now as i said creating a contemporary drum creating our own music um, we are teaching the next generation we are creating um, uh, space, uh, shows we are we have created a festival and everything but all these events when you don't have a space it's okay but when you want to sustain it's important that we also have a space in the landscape of the district otherwise the work it's not rooted somewhere and it's still fragile and it will be also challenging it means that in the legacy we want to transmit to the next generation they will have to find a place especially because since we have started we have started drumming on a daily basis every day from eight to noon from two to five we are also dancing and singing and juggling but the drums are really present and i have realized that instead of calling it music people are calling it noise it means that sometimes also pe now people don't want us to drum because we are making noise and uh, it is important everywhere we go we are chased because the neighborhoods are getting disturbed by the noise not by <laughs> the music we are making so we need to find a, an appropriate space where we can have the freedom to make our noise or where we find the we need our own space where we can have the opportunity to, 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 to drum. Of course, we, all, we are also thinking about how to drum differently so that we are not chased everywhere, so that, so that we have also access to, ma to, many, uh, to, the, to many opportunities out there because people don't want also to invite people at their events who makes noise. But we need now a space to root this new, uh, this new practice, this new tradition, so that it's sustained because we are really literally starting, starting from zero, from scratch. And everything has to be built so that it it's also provides uh, a conducive ecosystem for the women drummers. Otherwise, we will not sustain without now the space. Okay. Certainly, that's one of the, the challenges that we are looking at within the community space is how the environment itself, the, the barriers that are created um, can be turned into opportunities or how spaces or the built environment or even or the space around these activities create opportunities for sustenance or are critical for some of the, the projects that we work with in communities. Um, I wanted to ask George, uh, in your situation, which is kind of similar to Ordeal, um, how do you find the creation of the space uh, has created or has fomented the, the essence of the work that you do with the, with the migrants? How important is it to have those spaces? George, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> now, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, I was, say, I was saying that uh, in our view, uh, the space is also vital. Um, we actually choose a space. We are in a poor neighborhood. So this is Bilbao. Bilbao is like, okay, let's say a, a kind of wealthy, um, wealthy place, a wealthy uh, city within Spain. Nevertheless, we are located in the poorest uh, of the neighborhoods within Bilbao. And that was important for us, um, basically because that's where our community lives and that's where we wanted to work. And then we wanted to change the image and then we wanted to bring some pride to this neighborhood uh, from, from migrants. Uh, 
it's very difficult to to have to, to get a place and to make it sustainable uh, because always we are tied to this uh, let's say is it profitable not profitable are you making enough money to keep the the space and many times when you do ed uh, education uh, and when you do other type of activities that are more social than economical then uh, obviously you are gonna you are not gonna have benefit from those uh, the benefit is within the community so then you need that uh, those supports from from local government that actually believe they have to believe in what you're doing uh, sometimes you can get that sometimes sometimes you get it from from private uh, from private donors uh, in our case have been that been both cases have been the truth and then we have sustained uh we've been able to sustain a place um which actually was good actually we also playing we also play in drums uh good opportunity for us is like we play in drums we are in a basement of a school so basically when we play in drums where there's nobody to be to hear our noise because we also play drums uh, during the afternoon so basically um the space is cool for us uh, not just for playing drums but for all the activities that we got and the space is also key so the community has a place of belonging, a place where they can go back to and feel that they are, is their home. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you, George. Um, I think I'd like to bring in uh, Maria, uh, who's obviously- Hi. Um, can you hear me? We can do, fantastic. We've got you working, fantastic. Um, so you, Maria, you're obviously part of uh, Coops SF 34 alongside, obviously, um, uh, George. Uh, but it'd be really interesting to hear, I guess, uh, your view as a, as a, as a migrant uh, woman uh, operating in the entrepreneurial space um, and dealing with some of the challenges that George has highlighted. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the work that is available to you and what you do? Um, but also tell us how the city under, under, under COVID and, and, uh, and what COVID has presented to the city in terms of Bilbao. Um, has either somehow essentially limited your freedoms to continue practicing and, and undertaking your activities um, and potentially how uh, the community that Coop 34 has developed and, and shaped um, is helping to build maybe your own personal resilience, but also the, the resilience of the communities as well. Yeah, well, uh, I'm focused more in the culture uh, of art and theater performance. And of course, for whole the life, cult, uh, culture is the area more punish and more now with the COVID for more. So for a migrant, it's more difficult because um, you came without knowing to know anybody. So you start little by little. And what happened with the COVID with all the limits, it, all the theaters were very close. Uh, all the artists, we have to, to need to make art and talking with coworkers of art, we're looking that people needed a place where can forget the moment, only have a good time. So I discovered in the times of COVID that people go to the theater because couldn't be on theater because our closers, we decided to go outside and make art, street art. So in these moments of COVID, many artists start to go outside and um, playing guitars, make some performance, juggling. And this is time of the COVID that, that we start to make art together at the beginning, the first artist on the streets and give people some change because people were very stressful, were very scared. So people needed a moment to have fun, to enjoy it. Uh, of course, I'm a, to be migrant is, is difficult because um, at the beginning, the art is one of the areas more difficult to uh, to have a to, to live <laughs> and and being migrant is more difficult because you need to some contacts or or be a, a good um, a very expensive good school of art that recognizes you and i had the opportunity in cops and to uh, to start a theater like a classes and and, and people were looking a place to to talk a place to develop because they felt very, very um, close that couldn't make nothing. 
and and I feel like uh, it's an opportunity. And of course, in in the neighborhood more poor that have been bound, I think so. Culture can <laughs> can the culture can uh, close no close can. Mm, how can I say? Oh, but I look in the word in English. Uh, can broke the the skirts and can integrate mm -hmm. all different cultures of migrants people. Mm -hmm. I think so. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That's great. Fantastic. You're welcome. We'll hopefully expand on that a little bit later. Thank you so much. Marco, over to uh, sorry, Marcel, over to yourself. Okay, so um, I'd like to go back to to Fatu and ask you a bit more about the uh, the community that you're working with, Fatu. One of the things you talked about as well is uh, about financial inclusion of marginalized communities. So you're working with people who are obviously on the outside of of a system that um, is very difficult to access. So how have you found during COVID? that um, you've been able to continue with this drive for financial inclusion to offer a more equitable economic model for the for the people that you're working with. Can you elaborate on that element? Uh, so, certainly. So um, since I work in the construction sector, right, so everything having to do with, um, you know, the actual physical buildings of, uh, or the act of building buildings, producing materials for those buildings, and even um, from urban planning and zoning and how to densify appropriately. Um, so everybody that's living in the city is somehow concerned. And um, formal housing is a very small percentage of what's happening. Most of the housing is informal. And the reason why financial inclusion is really um, important is because those actors, I mean, they're market players. They're, they're very important actors in the housing market but they're entirely invisible because all of their transactions are informal. And so typically we know that there's lending that happens to people, low income and vulnerable populations, maybe to start a business or do certain things, but the business of domesticity, and that's what we saw during COVID, the business of building a house, managing that house, renting out a room, which typically is what women do, that business of domesticity is a real business outside of other commercial activities. And there's potentially a lot of capital there. And so how do we promote uh, financial inclusion in that those transactions, that collecting of rent, that building a new extension to the house or a latrine, if those transactions became visible, those vulnerable populations would then be able to um, have a credit history uh, because there is money that's going and that credit history then of course could offer, offer more possibilities. And if God forbid, you know, the pandemic continues and there are other restrictions and they're just left with this rental income, if that rental income is recognized somehow, then it becomes um, a, real, a real boon. And so what I can say is that there's financial inclusion, which we've been talking about for, you know, decades, but then I think a real opportunity is fintech, is the fact that all of these transactions now can be digitized. That really is a new um, frontier. And I think also for women who may not traditionally leave the home in the same way, being able to manage your funds and to record your transactions and to create your financial history over the phone um, is, is, is really something new that, that I'm, I'm personally championing. Okay, and, and George, uh, I know also in, in COPS you've been looking at moving in that direction, looking at more digital um, opportunities to operate within COPS, but up to now you've been working with women. Can you tell us some of the challenges? How, how successful are, are the models that you've been trying out at COPS and what are some of the challenges that women migrants are facing in that space in your community? First of all, since I'm not a migrant woman, I cannot be speak like in a in an expert level on that regard. But what I would say is like I've been uh, I've been in contact with many women that want to be that want to start to be an an entrepreneur, and uh, they choose cops to to come and to, to work with. We have several experiences, and then um, I also came to realize um, 
women entrepreneurship is much more difficult that to be a man, especially when you are a migrant. Uh, uh, basically, one of the things that Maria mentioned before, but is key to this, is the network. I mean, when you have no network and you come from to another country, being a woman, uh, basically all the household is uh, is is on your charge. So basically, your kids, uh, the, your kids are with you twenty four seven. When you were small kids, nobody is there to help you. You are you have to provide to them. At the same time, you have to find work, and then you can you cannot do both things at the same time. And nobody will give you a hand with with both. No, so that's 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 uh, among all the other problems that would be the major problem of all, for any woman that want to be an entrepreneur mm-hmm. in a, in, a, in, a, in a in a in a new place. No. Um, Specific for Europe are the the lack of papers. Obviously, when you come from from another country, then you will you will you won't have uh, documentation to in order to to get to work. And then all the the other culture. I think uh, I think we've lost you, George. Okay, while he's uh, he's he's reconnecting. Are you, are you back, George? Sorry, you're back. Am I? Lost yeah. You. Yeah. Sorry, where, carry on. Where did, you, where did you lose me? Where did you lose me? Well, I'll, I'll just repeat from the, from the, uh, um, a third, a third uh, problem would be like also the culture. Uh, uh, many people bring, or many husbands bring uh, culture, uh, strong culture from, from their home countries in which, uh, they have the, the last saying or they are going to rule if the woman can or, not, or, or cannot work. And sometimes this, is, this also presents a problem for the families, uh, like women not being able to work because uh, husbands, they don't find it appropriate or something like that. So uh, being a migrant woman, an entrepreneur, is very, very difficult. Just to work is hard. Being an entrepreneur is... is, 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 is more, more, more difficult. So yeah, in our team, we have tried to do in our in our co-working space is to create um, a good co-working spaces, meaning that uh, a co-working a natural co-working space here in Europe. Yes, Grandma. Yes, Grandma. Yes. Yes. Coming again. So I was, I was, I was saying that normally when you are in, in Europe, a working space would be just an empty space with, uh, with uh, internet connection, so people can join there and do the work online. Uh, what we have found in our process is like migrants, they need more tools. So the co-working spaces need to be equipped. So what we have done is like in our co-working spaces, we have different areas. So if we have the, the sewing section or the fashion section, we bring all the sewing machines. So people can come and, sew and do their fashion on the whole thing. Uh, if we are doing uh, on the digital area, we are trying to provide also with cameras, with internet, with uh, with computers. So you come to a space that is already equipped, you only have to bring your talent. And uh, our best and first uh, experience with women uh, who was in the, in, the cooking, in the cooking sector, basically we developed a market in which uh, women could come and actually uh, cook their dishes from their home countries and uh, sell it at an appropriate price. That would be that. That was an experience uh, for them in which they could have a place where they can actually sell their food. They are, they were not able to get their own place to have a, their own restaurant. So the solution was to have something in the community built for them, and uh, where they could also you know empower themselves and and try to to go for the next step. Thanks. Thanks a lot, George. And on the same note, I want to ask you a deal. That- the same around the same questions we've talked about you know economic uh, resilience in in the case of the women drummers i know you had uh, already started to look at uh, different financial models to to sustain yourselves as a group 
Um, how has the, you know, the COVID situation impacted on, on that? And, and what are you doing now to adapt under the current circumstances to, to continue being resilient through this, this tough time? Um, we we were lucky enough to to receive. I, I think it's really bizarre that it is the the fund the most the the the, the fund we have received in our seventeen years. They all came in this pandemic period. We never received fund before. It was very difficult, but during this time. <laughs> Uh, there were many fun to support artists uh, go through the pandemic and then we, we were lucky to get access to four panelists um, and, and just ask uh, if you can 